uh, that done, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, a very warm welcome to what is, in fact, chapter talk number six. We had five predecessors, and I was just looking at today at some of the range of topics that we've had, uh, dating back to the end of last year, dealing with leadership, dealing with innovation, climate change, and supply chains, SDG barometer, and last time, engagement with the global goals, all from different chapters around the world. And now I'm very pleased on behalf of the UK and Ireland chapter. I'm Jonathan Lowe, chair of that chapter, to welcome you to chapter talk number six, which is all about sharing information on progress reporting. And what we're going to do is to, you can see our title for today, which is how to write an award-winning SIP uh, report, uh, lessons from the front line. And Laura and my colleague Ali, uh, Alec are going to be talking around those themes a little later. And I know what Laura is going to be saying is she didn't set out to write uh, an award-winning SIP, but she just happened to do so. And if you've been on the website of Prime Global, you will have seen uh, the example of her work there. So what we're doing today, there's just a little brief welcome from the UKI chapter and what we do and where we've come from and, and uh, what our priorities are. We then, I'm then going to pass to Metamorsing to represent Prime Global and a, a welcome from Prime, Prime Global. I'm then going to pass over to our two principal contributors, Alec and Laura. Alec, who's a member of the SIP Impact Subcommittee, and Laura, who's our award winner, winner but we're not, it's not supposed to say that she's an award winner, from Queen's Belfast. And follow that, we're going to have Q&A with the audience, and then some further thoughts towards the end around where next with uh, SIP reporting. You may wonder why we've chosen this particular topic. Um, I think it's true to say that I, like many other people, when my turn to write a SIP comes round, those two years seem to have come round really, really fast. I can't say that I jump up and down and say, how fantastic, another SIP report to write. I'm probably a very poor advocate of a prime as a result, but the reality is they're not always easy documents to write. They are quite challenging documents to write, and it has been quite a theme around the um, UK and I chapter for some time about how we support our members to write uh, more effective SIPs which work both internally and externally. So we thought that we did have some expertise from around the chapter. It would be a good thing to share with you. Uh, it also adds to the diversity of the topics, of course. Now, talking to you today, here I am. I'm Jonathan Lowe in Oxford as your chair. Um, I just thought I'd show you what our UK and Ireland chapter looks like. So there are five, I'm going to use the neutral word territories within our chapter. There's Republic of Ireland, um, in which we have a number of members. We've got Laura, who's going to be talking to you from Northern Ireland in Belfast. We've got Alec, who's going to be talking to you from, well, he's attached to a university in Glasgow, maybe sitting in Edinburgh right now, uh, talking to you from Scotland. Sadly, right now, we don't have anyone talking to you from Wales and the Republic of Ireland, but we'll do our best for next time round. The UK and Ireland chapter was established in 2013. We have over 60 active business school members and many staff in all of those members who are very active in all of our activities. We're governed by an elected 10-person steering committee Highly competitive election process, it has to be said. Uh, we have many people wanting to join our steering committee and we're quite proud of our governance arrangements. And of course, we're very active as a chapter in prime global activities such as the working groups. What we do is offer our members, we think a growing and diverse way of engaging with the prime, with prime, with the SDGs and all our activities through our annual conference, workshops, webinars. Uh, we have a number of competitions, including a writing competition. And Laura was just telling me before this call, she's on one of the judging panels. We're just reaching the end of our 2021 round. We have a research seed funding competition to support uh, small research projects in the responsible management education arena. We just started an innovative pedagogy competition. And we're also just on the verge of starting a four-year paper development workshop series for those who want to publish more effectively, and I know that's a project that's close to Meta's heart because I know she's thinking about this as a wider project across the wider uh, Prime Global. This is led by colleagues from the University of Bath. So that's the chapter in a nutshell. We, we're a busy, active chapter. We'd like to think that we are collegial, mutually supportive, um, and that we have a good history of supporting uh, useful initiatives that advance the cause of Prime and the SDGs. If anybody wants more information about us, I'll put our uh, website link into the chat box after I finish. 
But right now, what I'd like to do is to invite Meta Morsing, who's sitting in New York, I understand right now, uh, to welcome you from Prime Global and say a few words about our theme for today. Meta. Jonathan, thank you so much for this introduction and thank you very much for organizing this uh, the Prime Chapter Talks number six, as you rightly say. Uh, I'm looking very much forward to learn a lot about how to write a SIP uh, award-winning uh, report and uh, and uh, to get into the details and the practicalities of this from, uh, from, uh, from Laura's side here today. Uh, and I just wanna say a few words about uh, the SIP report. As you may know, during last uh, the eight months uh, of last year, we were reviewing all the chapters and we were writing up new uh, memorandums of understanding and we were writing up new guidelines. So I think we really strengthened the, ch the chapter uh, structure and the governance structure last year. This year, we're focusing exactly on the SIP report. So I'm looking very much forward to this um, particular next hour here. And what we are doing, we are having a a committee, a subcommittee under the prime board, the prime global board to review from a, a variety of perspectives from around the world, uh, the SIP report, because we've seen over the years how those schools were really good at writing the reports, who are doing a lot uh, on, on, uh, on, on the report itself. Uh, some of them have all seems like, at least when we look at the reporting, seem to, you know, have halt a little bit in their reporting. At the same time, we see some of the newcomers to uh, Prime and to writing their first reports uh, are some sort of seeking a little bit out how to actually do this. Because as you rightly said, Jonathan, it is not an easy endeavor to embark on. So what we hope to do with the SIP uh, report review, and Alec is gonna talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but our ambition is to make it more helpful for beginners and also to push those who are more advanced with the SIP report. We are hoping to develop a bit of a journey in different levels where uh, schools can sort of sign up themselves and find helpful guidelines in a, a few steps, uh, whether they are beginners, whether they are, say, advanced, or whether they're really advanced uh, in SIP reporting. So it's a, it's a big task we are embarking on. It is a task that is also, we hope, going to be helpful for those schools who are or those schools who would like to be uh, accredited by accreditation agencies or who are being ranked uh, and asked for in input and ask for um, information content about their sustainable uh, development, their responsible management education activities. We also hope, and that's my last word here for, for now, we also hope it's going to be not just a reporting about the past that you know, you know, sort of can show the rest of the world how good you've been in the past. But we also would like this to be a little more uh, so looking into the future goal setting, if you like, and sharing. So we are sort of right now discussing how we could make this a, a kind of an open source uh, accessible uh, tool or reporting that everybody else can look into around the world. So thank you, Jonathan. Uh, these were my, my first remarks. Over to you. Thank you, Meta, for that uh, for that welcome and for the uh, introduction as well, but, and sort of setting the scene, uh, which I know Alec will be able to do even more so, as he is a member of the SIP Impact uh, subcommittee that you were referring to. So uh, just one piece of housekeeping before I pass over to Alec is to say, if you do have any questions and observations as we go, add them into the chat box. Uh, we will, I will keep a running tally of those as will Alec while Laura is talking later on. We'll feed them into the discussion later, but there will also be, given that the group is not too large, there will also be the opportunity to ask live questions. But don't lose a thought. Uh, if, you, if something occurs to you uh, while you're listening in, write it in the chat box and we'll keep a record of it. I'd now like to pass to Alec Worson, who is actually uh, my predecessor as chair of the UK and I uh, chapter, and who has taken an active interest in uh, all matters SIP for some time. Alec. Oh, wow, great. Okay, can you see my screen? I can, yes. Great, okay. Well, <clears throat> welcome everybody, and first of all, uh, greetings from uh, Scotland. I've just looked at the participants list, um, and I recognize quite a lot of names, and uh, there are some that are new there. Um, so whether I know you or not, um, welcome to this talk, and I echo everything that Jonathan and Meta have said. Um, I'm up here in Glasgow, rightly, uh, I work at Glasgow Caledonian University, but um, live in Edinburgh, so it's an east-west um, question. 
Now, SIP reporting is something close to our hearts. I don't know, it will be good to know uh, in the chat box from people how many of you are responsible for SIP report, you know, writing these things um, or not. Um, and anything you can share with us during this session would be fabulous because it's about knowledge exchange, I think, these prime talks. So um, it's not intended to be um, one way. Now, in terms of just to recap, um, I want to see, I assume that somebody and everyone knows something about SIPs, but the general principles are that uh, we normally report every two, every 24 months, two years. Every SIP requires a letter signed showing recommitment to the principles, the six principles and prime. Uh, the idea of a SIP report is to give a description of practical actions, assess outcomes, ideally. So it's not just about input, it's about output. And where possible, um, you're recommended to, in a SIP report to have some specific objectives, if you like, for the future. Uh, SIP reports can be written in any language, any format, and any layout. Now, if we think about it um, in general terms, we could say, well, how can business, the, the, the challenge facing us is how can business schools around the world use the SIP report to demonstrate their ongoing commitment to implement the six principles, integrate the SDGs into all of their activities, and critically, I think this is a critical point, and, and use the SIP report to inspire the community to do other things and get new ideas. Now, the great thing about SIP reporting, as Laura will tell you, is um, you can write these things and if you do a good job of presenting it to the global community, then you could get uh, an award for recognition of excellence in SIP reporting. And these SIP uh, awards are every global forum. Uh, there is a panel of judges that look at them and they look at how they've been put together and how they fit the overall criteria. And the, the star of today's talk is Laura Steele from Queen's Management School in Belfast. And as you can see at the Global Forum in 2020, Queen's Management School um, in Belfast, Queen's University, won the award for first time reporter. So I, I think it's uh, what we're going to learn from Laura's talk, I believe, is, uh, you know, what's it like uh, doing it for the first time, this daunting task. As Jonathan said, sometimes it's, um, it's plonked on somebody's desk and then you don't know where to start. So doing it for the first time is a very uh, daunting challenge. And as you can see on the slide, if you want to look at more experienced members of Prime who've written several SIT reports, you could look at Copenhagen Business School, Deakin in University or Hanken in Finland who are renowned uh, SIP reporters. Now, in terms of the run of play, what we're going to do is, I've switched the order slightly, is I'm gonna introduce Laura in a minute. Laura's gonna do a presentation of about uh, 50 minutes, I understand. Then we're gonna have Q&A. And after the Q&A, uh, in which I hope you'll be tremendously active, um, what I'd like to do is, direct discussion to the future of SIP reporting. So Laura's gonna to talk to us about uh, how she's doing it now, how they entered it. We hope to get something from the audience in terms of how you see SIP reporting. But critically, we want to look at the future of SIP reporting. And at that point, I would like to share some insights from the, um, the subcommittee on SIP reporting that is looking to develop a, a new set of guidelines that will be more forward looking um, and perhaps add additional perspectives. So without further ado, I'm going to um, uns unshare my screen and stop share. And I'm going to introduce to Laura. Now, Laura is a lecturer in business and society at Queen's Management School, Belfast. Where, she's also, where she also serves as her institution's prime champion. And her school 
He's also a member of the Prime Champions Group, of which there are 38. And prior to joining Queen's on a full-time basis in 2017, Laura worked predominantly in public sector organizations, including the Northern Ireland Assembly and Special EU Programs Body. She's vast experience in legislation, governance, information management, and reporting. And Laura's been involved in the school's membership of Prime since the outset. So without further ado, a round of applause or a welcome to Laura Steele. Hurrah. Thank you very much, Alec. I'll just share, um, I'll just share my screen with you now. There's already a really interesting comment uh, there in the chat about the burden. Um, of reporting so unfortunately when I share my screen um, I can't I can't see you so hopefully anybody will shout out um, if you have any if you have any issues um, in seeing that so you'll first thing you'll notice and it's something that Jonathan has already alluded to um, is the fact that I felt sorry that it was can I just say Laura your slides are not oh. visible if you've shared oh gosh sorry I will um, I will attempt that again apologies um i've been shifting between multiple different platforms today and uh, uh have, that's have absolutely fine now great. thank you so much um so as jonathan had alluded to um i think i felt it was a little bit too much um to say that i could tell you how to write an award-winning uh, set report because to be honest that was more by accident than, than design and um whenever it was announced in in june of 2020 i almost fell off my chair and i had to wait till they repeated it and um, just to make sure that i hadn't misheard so Instead, what I can do is tell you how we wrote our SIP report and highlight some, some of the challenges um, that we faced and, and how we've tried to get around those. But I think as, as was just highlighted in the comment there that it, it is a big burden reporting. And so what we're constantly looking for is ways to try and streamline that and to collect information that can be used for multiple different purposes. But I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, in a moment. So in terms of our institutional uh, context, we became a signatory to Prime in uh, 2017. I was actually recruited in um, to lead um, on Prime and, and other work related to ethics, responsibility and sustainability. So um, my, my entire journey uh, with Prime um, has been the same as Queen's journey um, through Prime. And um, if you are new to Prime, it's probably one of the best things that I have been involved in. I've learned so much and I've also had the opportunity to engage with really wonderful people um, from around the world and, and I'm hoping that for the rest of my career that I'll still have um, interaction with Prime through that. So one of the first things that we started to do back in 2017 was start collecting information and um, which is as most people would agree is a really challenging thing in any organizational context but can be particularly difficult um, within universities the sheer volume of data and it's often held in silos um, and you don't even necessarily know what information is being captured um, in the first place. So there's a really strong interest in our school. Um, I think one advantage that we have that there was, it was a really strong interest in terms of um, issues like ethics, responsible management and sustainability. But there's often a huge lack of communication, um, both across uh, and within departments. I'd say, honestly, that that is still a problem um, that we are trying to overcome. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, shortly. And so our first SIP report was submitted in 2019. And what that of course means is that we have another one due in 2021. So we're back again um, at that point within the cycle. So this is our end product. This is what was eventually um, submitted. We're uh, proud of it. I mean, as with anything, you can see the areas where you would want to develop further, where you would um, have room for improvement. But ultimately, especially for our first SIP report, um, we ended up being happy um, with what was um, what was produced. And I think though, whenever you see the end product, you don't um, you don't necessarily see all the um, all the struggle that went into it. And um, the fact that even days beforehand, it was quite a messy document that that um, it hadn't really fully come to together and so I think that's one thing that I really wanted to, to highlight um, is the fact that um, it can be a really daunting process and um, it can it can certainly induce a little bit of anxiety and um, whenever you're the person who is given the SIP reports to compile and so anything that we can do to try and make that process more straightforward for you we would be delighted to help. So starting at the end and then now moving our way backwards to the start of the process. So what we did um, or what I did, because I'd say about 90% of the of the production of the of the SIP fell to me, just because we we are a relatively small school with um resources of um, of developing the SIP report. 
um, was that I went and looked at the basic guide to SIP. So there is a document, there's also a set of slides available online, and it's a really valuable tool if you haven't reported um, before. It gives you guidance on how to approach the SIP report. Probably of equal value is going and looking at examples from other institutions. So what I did um, in that regard was to go and look at some of the award-winning reports from previous years. The one thing I would caution about that is if you go and look at the likes of Copenhagen Business School or Hamken um, or any of other of those leading institutions, um, they've been reporting for, uh, for years. The quality of what they're producing and the length of it is extensive and it could end up giving you some almost a bit of a fright in terms of what is expected. I was very lucky that I had a conversation with Sheila Killian um, from Kemi Business School in Limerick and uh, she, she just advised me to, to really lower um, our expectations, especially for the first report. It's really about setting a benchmark and um, that's what you're aiming uh, to have so that you can then build upon that in future years. So don't be panicked um, by going and looking at some of those um, award winning reports from organisations that are maybe on their second, third plus um, SIP report at this stage. And um, I come from background um, of teaching organisational behaviour, so in terms of my view of the SIP reporting process, it was less the, the rational model and more of a garbage uh, can model of SIP reporting, but it does prove that you can come out of the, um, of the process with something um, that's strong nonetheless. But as I said, even up to days beforehand, um, we saw multiple things that we knew needed to go into the report, we hadn't quite found a home for them. So again, don't be panicked if it's um, even quite late in the process you're still trying to get everything to come together. So we originally started with a very different uh, structure. I had a different idea for what our SIP report would ultimately look like. I tried that um, for a period of weeks to get the information to fit within it, and it just wasn't working. So we end up reverting back to the six principles of crimes. If you take a look at our report, you'll see that um, we have the six principles. And at, this, um, at the end of the report, we actually have a seventh, um, which is um, organizational practices, which technically isn't one of the six principles, but is something that, um, that Prime encourages us um, to think about. So it's about um, really walking the talk in terms of what we do internally, for example, in relation um, you know, to supporting uh, staff members and students in terms of um, you are building and, and our approach to sort of the environment and climate change. That ended up being sort of the key and um, that once we had started to focus on the six principles, everything started to come together. It was significantly more straightforward, but a thing to say is that you will likely have activities that cut across multiple different principles, and it's about really using your judgment as to which one you put things under. So some things we could sit under um, sort of principle three or principle four, and you might have to make a decision as it where it best to uh, where it best fits in. And sometimes that's um, looking for you know, the optimal rather than the ideal way to compile your report. A really big thing um, for us was reflecting on the shortcomings um, that people typically identify in reports of this nature. So um, as Alec had mentioned, I come from a background of working in the public sector and um, particularly uh, within the context of information management. And the last job that I'd had before I came to Queen's was working for an organisation called the Special EU Programmes Body. So that body was charged with dispersing around uh, half a billion uh, euros worth of funding in, in Ireland, in Northern Ireland and Western Scotland and we had been dragged over the coals in previous years because of poor reporting, in particular a lack of focus um, on um, the actual uh, outputs and outcomes um, and the impact of how that money was being spent. So obviously vast sums involved, um, uh, very, uh, very different to context to SIP reporting but the actual problems underlying it were the same and that was people were asking yes you're doing these things, you're investing money, you're, you're running projects but what is the actual impact of that and once I became aware of that and started to apply it to our own SIP report, it really changed the way that we started to approach things. And now, um, you know, it's not just about running an activity or, or collecting information on research, it's about really trying to quantify the impact that that is having. So data collection has been a really big challenge for us, and I would suspect that it's a challenge for anyone involved in SIP reporting um, or actually reporting in general. Um, data collection um, right from the outset was one of the biggest hurdles we had to overcome. 
So it's specifically deciding you know, what information to include, where that information was located, if it was even captured at all, and trying to determine who had access um, to it. So some of that was obviously information held within the management school. We also needed some information from the wider university as well. And I would say that I, I spent quite a long time trying to figure out um, what information we needed and where that was located. But we found ways to try and streamline that process. It's also, I think, as much as anything about deciding what not to include. Um, I think that's perhaps more of a pressing problem whenever you get on to your second and third plus SIP reports, that as we, as we started to capture more data, um, you could potentially end up with a SIP report that runs to you know, 50, 60, 100 plus pages. But does anybody really want to sit and read through that? Um, or is it more of an exercise of self-indulgence um, for our part? So I think that um, that'll be a big question for us this time around is what do we put in and what do we leave out and as was highlighted earlier that there's flexibility within SIP reporting so even if something doesn't necessarily go in we can put it on our website or we can disseminate that information in other ways I think we're going to take the approach of keeping our SIP report and um, you know, perhaps to 40 50 60 pages um, at most this time around rather than allowing it to become overly long and having people not read the whole thing. So teaching, we tended to look at ours um, across three different uh, pillars. The first one was teaching, and, and we collect information about ethics, responsibility and sustainability, as well as corporate connections, internationalisation and technology enhanced learning via our module review form. So um, in the management school for, um, for decades now, um, we uh, conduct annual module reviews, and those um, were a way for us to start to capture some extra information. So what we have now at the start of each module review form that um, module coordinators or module leaders um, fill in is a number of boxes at the start where people um, include a numerical ranking from zero to four and then also um, some text around how they're covering these issues if at all. So say a zero for example would be where it's not appropriate for that module. So we do have a few say computational modules where um, there is, is no scope to cover ethics or responsible management or sustainability within that module. Um, it ranges then from um, a one, which would be very light coverage, all the way up to a four, where it's an integral part of the learning outcomes for that particular module. I say we do that as well for corporate connections, internationalization and technology enhanced learning. And it has been one of the best things that we have done because it means that every year we're getting fresh data, which is showing uh, progress across those areas. It also means if we see uh, modules where those issues could be covered and they're not, um, then someone can, uh, can con contact the module coordinator and have a chat with them. As I've done, you know, said, oh, could you put in, you know, would it be potential to put in around climate change in this module or uh, other aspects of sustainability around business ethics and then can help them and direct them to resources to help them do that. We did get a bit of resistance and um, everybody's under pressure and that's the reality of the situation. It's asking people to do one more thing, um, but by integrating it into one form that they already have to complete, um, I would say that we have around at least sort of 95 plus percent of module coordinators will send us that information each year. It's collated by somebody within the administration team and it means that we um, have it updated annually, which has been an enormous help. Research outputs is a really tricky one. Perhaps you've got a better way of doing this than I do, in which case I, I would love to uh, hear about it. So we currently manually code those from the back end of Pure. Um, if you aren't familiar with Pure, it's a, a research, um, it's a research um, information management um, software package that is used widely across the world. And you can download, you can go into the back end of it and download information. You can actually tag um, information within Pure. So we use P uh, Prime as a tag. We use the UN Sustainable Development Goals as a tag. The reality is not everybody will uh, tag their specific research with, say, SDG 8 or SDG 12. So we do still have to do that manually. Um, but as I said, if you've got a better way, this is a great opportunity to share that. Probably external engagement is one of the trickiest uh, uh, things to capture. So that includes things like, you know, external seminars, talks, engagements with schools or community groups. Some of that will get recorded in Pure, but much of it isn't. Um, so I have to end up uh, trawling through the university website. And to be honest, a lot of that comes from face-to-face you know, -face conversations with people or somebody mentioning something relevant they've done. So I'd say that's the area over the next two years that I'd really like to work on is developing, um, is developing 
thinks of better structures um, and processes for capturing information around those engagement activities, because I suspect there's a lot being lost. A thing I think that um, uh, people liked about our SIP report, um, certainly from uh, my, my conversations with people, is that we decided to use key performance um, indicators. So as I said, coming from a background in reporting, um, that there has been obviously a trend towards using KPIs, um, and I thought it was a, a useful inclusion within our SIP report. Quantifying those, some of the goals was really tricky, and I, I certainly wouldn't hold up our KPIs as you know as beautiful examples um, of uh, of ideal KPIs. Um, but it's a work in progress, and I think you know that there's a general understanding within the Prime community that that is the case, and um, that we're we're not um, you know we're not perfect, um, but we are trying to be honest, and we're trying to also set ambitious goals, even if that perhaps um, sort of creates a, a risk of failure. And I'll talk about that more in. A second. As far as possible, what we tried to do was just not be vague. As far as possible, we tried to set specific targets um, that uh, we could strive to meet. But realistically, as a result of some of the disruption caused by the pandemic, probably what's going to happen is whenever I, you know, I've been tracking those KPIs over time and I know that there are a few that we're really going to struggle to meet by the uh, time our next SIP report is due, um, simply because of, for example, social distancing and also the additional work burden that has been presented um, by ac uh, for academics and also uh, members of uh, administrative staff. So I think in that event, honesty is the best policy. I think we're just going to have to be open and frank um, about those areas where um, we didn't quite meet the KPI. Equally, there'll be things that we've done that we didn't uh, set out to achieve back in 2019. Um, but nonetheless, as a result of the pandemic, um, we felt that they were beneficial, say, for staff or for students, um, and, and they became a priority and perhaps other things um, uh, became less of a priority over that period. The SIP report is, I believe, at its core means of communication, and that communication is as much um, focused on the internal uh, factor as the external one that it's been really useful um, in terms of internal communication around the, um, the university and um, across departments. It's gone to some of the most senior people within our institution, and it's been a really fantastic way of, of letting them know what we are doing. So um, I think just stressing that it's about demonstrating progress and not perfection, as Sheila Killian said to me, it's about having a benchmark, about having something to work from, rather than presenting some sort of idealized version um, uh, of, um, of our uh, current situation within Queen's. So the last few points are actually producing the steps. You've gathered your data, you've spoken to people, you've made your notes, you've decided on your structure. Um, some people may benefit um, from your organisation having uh, you know, easy access to graphic designers or uh, people can help you with that. Um, I didn't have access um, to that. Part of it was also a speed issue um, that it would have had to be sent away weeks in advance to get that work done. And, and I was, to be honest, working up quite close to the deadline. So I ended up using an online platform called Canva. If you've not heard of Canva, it is a fantastic tool. It, um, everything in our SIP report was produced um, in Canva. And uh, uh, I think that uh, it, it made the process really straightforward. And as I'll show you in a moment, um, it can also be used for other things as well. You can upload your brand typeface, your colors, the SDG uh, logos and, and icons as well. We had a big problem actually, and if you are really early in your journey to producing your SIP report, I would encourage you to think about this now. Actually finding enough high quality images as in high enough resolution um, was surprisingly hard. So now what I do is I try every time I see a good image um, internally, um, I save it so that we have access to that whenever we come to put things together. We also used a few images from free stock image sites like um, Unsplash and Pixels of the wider kind of Northern Ireland landscape. We had branded icons, which you'll see there on the slide, but Flat Icon is another great um, resource um, that has icons on it, which just help to make your uh, report a bit more visually appealing. A big question was how and where to use the SDG icons. Somebody again gave me good advice and, and they said, you know, don't just use them because they look good um, and they add a bit of colour to your report. Um, you know that there's been a move away from that. And I know that I've certainly seen them not so much in SIP reports, but in other publications where um, I don't feel that their use is, is appropriate. 
So instead, what we did was we restricted the use of the SDG icons to areas where we felt there was a really strong justification for their use. Um, so uh, where we know that they were being specifically covered within modules or within teachings and, and that we could stand over um, our use of those icons because they're very important and I think that we need to treat them um, with due respect. So we obviously have been through one cycle of SIP reporting and we have another one due um, later this year. And so a big question, and actually it's really interesting because Meta um, sort of touched upon it earlier that once you've you know, done your first SIP report or even your first few SIP reports, how do you um, avoid regressing um, or what I call the, you know, the sophomore slump? Um, you know, how do we make sure that our SIP report is of an equal or ideally better quality? So things that I've been thinking about is, is just trying to work on it as early as possible. And that doesn't mean necessarily doing some formal work on the actual document, but just gathering as much information, talking to people about the SIP report and that includes talking to people externally within the prime community um, and, and even old colleagues from the public sector and, and so forth, getting their suggestions, getting their input. Gathering all that uh, material, there's a saying in Ireland, I don't know whether um, you have it in other parts, but it's better to be looking at it than looking for it. Um, so everything, even if it doesn't ultimately make it into our document, I try to save all of that down in a big folder so that I have it. Little and often is an approach that um, we are going for um, at the minute. So the what is on the uh, the side of your screen there is a new as of um, this month um, internal update um, on uh, on progress. So. Um, highlighting things you can see there, the things that are hyper happening in Prime, like the Virtual Global Forum, um, but other relevant um, events. That's all produced in Canva. It takes very little time to do once everything is set up. And then we can harvest some of that to ultimately go into our SIP report in due course. Hopefully we'll be starting from a better position than the first time around where we really didn't have anything. And then the last point is engaging and learning from peers. Um, so. I have had you know universally find that people within the prime community are more than happy um, to provide guidance and support to us whenever we were developing our first SIP report. Um, you whether that's um, you through the likes of um, the, the uh, prime chapter conferences, the uh, virtual global forum, um, but also just um, dropping somebody an email and saying I'm struggling with this. Um, Sheila Killian took me for a coffee. Um, other people, whenever I was at the conference and um, whenever we could meet face to face back in 2019, um, gave me lots of great advice. Um, and I believe it's you know it's my turn to try and pay that forward. So you absolutely email me if you're if you're struggling, um, but reach out. It's a very friendly um, community and people. People were only keen, too keen to help me. And so um, if I can help anybody else, um, please do get in touch with me. But that's the end of my um, that's the end of my slides. Uh, Alec, hopefully there was some value in that for people and I'll stop sharing uh, now. I'm mute. Well, what I'm going to do is a virtual clap, uh, Laura. So um, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. For well, that, well, I I, I was busy uh, scribbling my notes. I'm sorry if I wasn't uh, looking at the stream because there were uh, a lot of little gems in there from my perspective. Um, but perhaps we could just um, uh, before I come to any questions, we could just pick up um, a couple of things from the um, from the chat. Uh, you you said that at the beginning that um, Georgina Goff down at UWE was talking about the you know the challenge the reporting burden. Uh, of it. Uh, I don't know if any other members of the audience, how they feel about it. Is it trepidation? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know precisely how many on the call actually are responsible for, um, for SIP reports. Is there any indication? Uh, could you, in the chat, or um, do we have a polling system, Sophie, that you could um, quickly rattle up? Um, I'm checking now. I'll try and get something going. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know. Um, Sorry, Alec, I was just going to butt in because Georgina's comment was actually partly about the burden, but actually it's a, another really interesting point as well, which is how you get your how you set up a template to do multiple reporting when you reply when you're needing to report to Prime, AACSB, whatever it might be, and whether there would have been any experience around the room in regard to that. So that's definitely one to pick up either here or, or beyond. But if anybody does have experience of using a common template, then tell us about it. Laura, 
I can so um anybody who's been involved in um in Equus will probably recognize um the terms that I use there in relation to our module review form. So um th that's taken from Equus. Um is uh, so Equus calls it ERS um and then also of course I think it's corporate connections and internationalization technology enhanced learning. So we took we uh, decided to go with the Equus terminology, and so that's captured. Um, that's captured in those module review forms and we use that for Equus and then also can take some of that information for AACSB as well but that has been one of the you know one of the the difficult um issues is is the multi the burden of multiple reporting so that was one small way that we partially address that but um it's certainly I think it remains a, a significant issue and, and I think the reporting requirements are probably going to only um increase for some of those accreditation bodies uh, Laura, can you, uh, emerging from the chat as well, could, could you comment on how do you store your data? I mean, how do you organise it and, and store it? Um, I, I think that was probably one of the uh, one of the advantages of coming from a background in, in information uh, management was that I tried from the outset just to have a very logical um, system for uh, for storing information. So. Uh, just I'll be honest it's just multiple um it's just multiple different files I think the the key for me was staying on top of things um and and not allowing too much to build up and just trying to do a little bit little and often really has been the philosophy for it but I did notice that that some people are, have experienced exactly the same problem the images and and you think the images is not going to be a big issue and so as a result I hadn't really given it much thought until the last minute and then suddenly you realize actually we need um quite a lot of um of different imagery for our SIP report certainly if you want it to be um visually appealing so I really like that um somebody in the chat had said there that their PR team um captures and and collates um all of their image which means that they've got an image bank there i would say that's an area that we need to work on we do have some um stuff but it's um it tends to be a little bit dated um or maybe not necessarily of a high enough uh, resolution so um it's about building and um, building systems saving things at the time so that you don't end up having to go and search for them maybe six months or a year down the line yes um yeah that was igorim kalmenova who said that they have an internal digital space where they save the uh, photos. Uh, could we come back to you, uh, Laura, about Canva? Um, someone's also asking, um, does Canva struggle with documents for so many with so many pages? I had no issues at all with it. So it does take a little bit with Canva. You have to invest a little bit of time at the start. Um, so uh, I, what I did was uploaded the brand colors. So we're lucky that we have a document. I'd say almost every university is bound to have one, a document which has your font, um, your brand, color, the hex codes for your brand colors, all of that information. You feed that into Canva um, and then it sits there for you. If you upload images to Canva, uh, whether they be images of your university or the SDG icons or so forth they sit in there for you canva also is free stuff. So if you pay for um the paid version of canva which is around um ten dollars a month i think it is and um, then you get access to free stock images as well and icons and certainly um you know we i think our SIP report ended up being around if you include um sort of covers and things like that probably around 50 pages and um i had no problem um no problem with that handling uh, that size of file and uh, i i think that i couldn't see a problem going over you know 70 80 pages with it um and it's just easy you just slot things in it's if i don't have a background in graphic design and was able to do it with ease so i think anybody can um anybody can use it it's a great tool I mean, ju just to clarify, Laura, are you saying that you actually put the document together in Canva yourself? I did, yeah. So every everything was, and I'm not that I am I'm not holding myself up as as being particularly skilled in that regard. But yes, the entire document um, I I put together in Canva. And there was nobody else um, involved in that. So that's that's a reflection of how simple Canva is, rather than my own abilities, to be honest. I'm sure you're being uh, humble and modest. Uh there but because I, I think that uh, my experience certainly at my institution is that we use the comms department to do the you know the design touch and so uh, the, the Canva idea of, of doing something that's um, easy to use and and doable it can take some of the uh, stress I suppose out of doing it um, could I raise a question to you Laura about uh, to you and anyone in the audience um, about using SIP 
and data capture in a, in a live sense and, and using it as a live document across the school? This is a question from James Musgrave. Um, he says, has anyone used good docs or other sharing platforms? Do you have any experience of anything like that, Laura? No, but I think it's a brilliant, um, a brilliant idea, and I think it's something that we'll definitely uh, look into. Um, I think it's, and, and especially you think for, you know, anybody who's taking over. There's a comment there that was in the chat, um, just uh, from somebody there, just scrolling back up, but from Lauren, who's taking over um, from a, a colleague and. I mean, that must be a really difficult position. I was lucky that I came in and there was nobody before me. So I was starting from scratch, but I'm sure it's, it's as difficult, perhaps even more difficult to take you know, over for somebody else. So if you have a repository of documents, say through Google Docs, um, that at least would, would allow, um, you know, that would allow hopefully a more simple handover and also for things to be held for a long period of time. So I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Well, thank you. Yes. And we, we've got Christine Oxtava up uh, here in Scotland in, in Dundee. Um, she's saying she's responsible for their, her first sit. What would be your two go to's advice to Christina, uh, Laura, first time reporter? First time uh, reporting. And, and it's a difficult one, but start as early as possible if you can. Um, it's a bit like what we advise our students to do with their assignments, but the reality of the situation, especially in the middle, um, you know, in the midst of a global pandemic, um, is that that we're all under time pressure. And so as a result, you end up sometimes having to do things in, in a shorter amount of time than you would uh, you would like to. In that kind of situation, um, you know, I don't know what level of support you have from within the organization, whether you can get help um, to produce that document, but, you know, I think it's about really stressing the um, the fact that this is important. It's a requirement if the organisation wants to be part of Prime, um, if they want to um, if they want to be part of the Prime community, that ideally they need to report. In which case, I think that there's a, a it's incumbent um, on the leadership within the school to provide additional support um, for that um, for that because it's a very difficult thing for one person um, to do alone the other thing is um, you send me an email and we can have a we can have a virtual uh, coffee and a chat and um, you particularly if you, it's your first uh, time doing a SIP report um, you, we can we can have half an hour or an hour for for a coffee and have a chat um, and you can we can discuss your specific you know organization the challenges that you're having I'd be absolutely delighted to do that thank you so much on behalf of my colleague here in Scotland um, let me present a scenario to you, Laura. Um, let's say, for example, uh, your dean comes to you and says, oh, uh, Laura, we want you to move to um, th this other job and, um, and Jimmy over there is going to be taking over SIP reporting. Um, and Lauren McCarthy at Royal Holloway says she's taking over from um, um, a colleague. Yeah, and so they've got a decent foundation, but... I think in, in uh, the stories I hear um, from colleagues in the UK in the past is, and, and internationally, is the lead for Prime changes. And, and so while the institution may have been there, they've written two or three SIP reports, there's no institutional memory. Where, where's the information? How do you transfer it? What, what would you do in that situation? Um, you know, to ensure that people like Lauren, if it happened in your institution, weren't left in a void. Yeah, I think that's something that many schools have an issue with is, as you say, the lack of institutional uh, knowledge in regards to Prime. Uh, my view on it is that um, if we are involved in responsible management, then we, those of us who are currently <laughs> um, in the position, have a responsibility to make sure that the person who takes over for us eventually, whether that's you know, in a year's time or five years time or, or, or whenever that is, are not left in the lurch. Um, so if it was me handing over, um, I, I would try to make that as long a process as, as possible and that even if I left the organization even if I left Queens and went somewhere else um, I would feel a responsibility to continue to to help that person because it is a daunting task and then that goes all the way back actually to the to the earlier point about having good systems in place um, and so I've tried to collate everything together and that includes stuff that Prime has produced the likes of you know, the documents and the slides and so forth about SIP reporting also I think um, it's about trying to help that person make new connections within the Prime community. So putting them in touch um, with other members um, of the of your particular chapter, um, or maybe even other chapters, and getting them involved and and helping them 
to navigate that early part of, of the process. So I would hope as responsible management um, scholars that we would practice that responsible management in terms um, of, of handing over eventually um, responsibility of prime to someone else. But um, that's something as well, I think that we can think about as we are sort of going about um, our work is making sure that we, we keep um, a good orderly system um, in place so that eventually um, whenever our time with prime um, comes to an end or somebody else takes up reporting, that we'll be able to hand that over to them that um you know that we are just we represent just um you know one one cog in the um in the machine really in that respect and, and we can do a lot now to help somebody else tomorrow yeah of course okay Sorry, Alex, I'm, I'm, do, you mind if I, do you mind if i just <clears throat> jump in and ask you and meta a question because it's related to that last uh, meta Go which ahead. is and it's also somebody raised it in the chat i can't remember who say you need to come and write your latest sip report and you look back at the last sip report which set goals or kpis that have not been met so you know if we're a learning community then we should really be sharing in full detail you know what hasn't been met and why but there's obviously a natural reluctance to do that because this is a public document. I'd like your take, Meta and Alec, on how to handle that scenario. Let's start with Meta. Thank you very much for this challenge, Jonathan. <laughs> no, I absolutely agree with, with the, you know, and I, thank you very much for all the comments out there. I've been taking notes. It's very, very uh, insightful. Uh, it's a it, that is a very big challenge, of course, and also because there's two years between those reports are published, so it's quite some time actually um, that that's going on. And what you promised two years ago, the world may have changed considerably, you know, since since then. So, uh, and of course, what we would like to do is to track um, progress. So it's the tracking of progress uh, that that is very uh, interesting here, and and of course, ideally, we would like the school. Uh, reporting to explain why that goal was not reached and there may be very very many good explanations for for that so maybe think, some bad ones too maybe even some <laughs> bad ones too exactly but then uh, it's a matter of explaining that you know in a in a in a way that of course you want this to be a good document you want this to be an honest document, as Laura has also emphasized a number of times, uh, because the first one, if you lie, the first one who, who will find out that's your colleagues uh, and, and your students. So you absolutely don't want to, to go that route, of course. But I think it's, it's fair to say that you would like that explanation. And I think that's very much the, the spirit of the SIP report, because everybody else will, will be able to recognize uh, the challenge that you may have faced in not reaching that, that particular goal uh, amongst your peers even though it may be a difficult one. We can see that in corporate reporting also. I've been following corporate reporting, you know, for, for some years. And I, I think that some of the corporate reporting that I admire most is the reporting that have started to talk about dilemmas, have started to talk about even sort of paradoxes that unresolved, unresolvable challenges or wicked problems, if you like, that are not easily um, met but that you know you you try to meet them, and it's even the you know it's the try the attempt itself that is very important. So uh, it, it's not a very firm response to the very good question here. It's something we need to think about. But I but I think back to Laura's uh, one of Laura's many good comments is that you you need to explain, you need to be honest about why you didn't reach the goal and how you will try to strive even harder, or maybe you will set another goal for some other reason. And I think that's a really important message that everybody here or watching later takes back, that that's the encouragement that you are giving from the Prime, Prime Global to be honest, to be upfront, to engage in learning and, for, and to share that learning in so much as you feel able. Alec, do you just want to add any further comments? I'm aware that we're coming up to time. so we I know that that's a, a, a wicked question, so typical of you, uh, Jonathan. Uh, but I, th I think the answer is, um, it, it, it's uh, it's a question of continuous improvement, and if we if we're to be genuine about that, we've got to inject a little uh, humility, I suppose, into our reporting, because we all do our best to put our best foot forward, put the best face on, um, and we we need to, I think, perhaps pinch ourselves now and again and say, um, hang on a bit, you know, yes, let's let's showcase and lighthouse the key points, but let's um, talk about some of the challenges. But if you allow me, it, it leads us nicely into, I, I suppose, the final bit, Jonathan, with that wicked uh, question. I'm going to share my screen again. 
Um, and uh, if, if we look here, we, we go the future of SIP reporting now. Sorry, um, uh, Alec, you're not that you're not sharing at this oh, stage. Sorry, here we go. Are we on? Yes. Are we on? So we're, we're on the future, you know, audience Q and A and SIP reporting. And let me just share with you perhaps um, th this slide. Um, and let me preface it that I'm going to say a few things. I'm going to use this work from Giselle Weibrecht. Um, the author of the primetime blog, which I understand is, is um, winding up soon. And she did an, an analysis of SIP reporting between 2013 and 20. Um, and looking at all the SIP reports, she found that 90% of reports had this letter signed by the highest executive of the organization. Um, 100%, 100% of SIP reports, isn't it marvelous? Had, a, had great descriptions of practical actions. They told great stories. But if you look at points three and four, only 25% of SIPs have an assessment of outcomes, of impact, right? So we're telling stories, but we're saying, yeah, but what, what difference did it make? What difference did it make? And if we look at Prime as a transformational project, uh, a project that, is trying, we're all trying in our own ways to transform management education, make it different through responsible management education. Only 25% are looking at KPIs and outcomes. And this is not a criticism. This is, this is just research, I'm presenting the facts. And specific objectives, only 30% of SIT reports in the last seven years are actually setting specific objectives. And I, I think that I think that at the bottom of the slide, we can see some of the very good reasons for, for what this research is showing. And, and it represents some of the challenges. And that's, what, that's why we get mixed quality of SIPs. And that can be perhaps explained by limited resources within schools. People are doing prime on top of the day job. Um, you know, so they're, they're pressed on time, they're pressed on resources. They might not be able to use Canva like Laura does. Uh, they might not have that skill set um, uh, in managing uh, information. Um, current SIPs are largely qualitative. Uh, I think the, SIP, the, the current SIP committee is observing that the, the, quality, the stories in SIP reports are absolutely fabulous. They're, they're, a lot of them are uplifting, but there are very little metrics. There's very little quantitative data, very little on measurement of impact. And, and we all know when we look at even the Financial Times and, and others that they're sort of saying, well, how can we measure impact? If you look at the Times Higher Education rankings, it's, it's social impact. And, and I think that what the subcommittee, uh, the, the SIP subcommittee is looking at is how can we um, together offer guidance and, and uh, advice on uh, signatures reporting on impact. So balancing the qualitative with the uh, quantitative. And um, Meta could might want to come in on, on the next point I'm going to make that um, in terms of the future of SIP reporting, and I'll be very interested to hear anything in the chat from everybody here, that if, as a pri as the, if, if we think of ourselves as a movement, not as individual institutions, but we're part of a global movement which is 850 institutions now that wish to change the way management education is designed and delivered, then we need to demonstrate impact. But SIP reports are very hard to compare. But wouldn't it be wonderful, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could collect data from in SIP reports or harvest it of the impact that we as 850 institutions in a community, the impact we've made collectively, where people would actually open their eyes and go, wow, isn't that amazing? Because we can't just look at that on an institutional level, we look at it at the prime collective level. Meta, could I ask you to comment perhaps on that? Thank you. You said it very well, Alec, uh, about the, the one thing is, you could say, the local uh, impact for the individual school, but the collective impact uh, would be wonderful. 
if we look upon our friends, our colleagues in the engineering sciences, the technical sciences, the natural sciences, I think it's fair to say that uh, a lot of the funds, a lot of the attention, a lot of them arguing for how they influence and impact the world uh, towards sustainability is perhaps uh, in a sense a little more material and, um, and prob probably valued or more easy to understand for a number of audiences than what it is we as business schools, as management schools, uh, are delivering on that uh, on that front. So I would really like to, at the global level, collectively be able to uh, account for in the qualitative sense, but also in the quantitative sense, for our impact, our social impact uh, on the world. And this is this is another ambition, uh, a high ambition with this SIP uh, subcommittee. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and, and if I could just pick up on that and back to you, Laura, I mean, I, I think the impact it's the six principles, but you 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 featured the SDGs and you were saying, well, how can we report on the SDGs? Because reporting against the SDGs or contributing to the SDGs is one way that we can try and capture impact, isn't it? Would you like to comment on that, Laura? Um, yes, so we, again, is something that we're hopefully getting a bit better at is reporting against the SDGs. So um, both in terms of teaching and also research as well. So what we do now, uh, when we started, we were just checking research against uh, relevant to prime, but now we've taken it a level further and are coding it against relevant SDGs. But again, trying to maintain sort of a high threshold in terms of um, in terms of what um, what constitutes um, being aligned to the SDGs and, and meeting the goals rather than just putting everything into that. I, um, I, I, you do recall that there was another part of the university um, had um, had tracked something they were doing against, um, I think it was, um, and I, and I usually have the SDGs off the top of my head now, but um, something it was one related to ending hunger, but it was something that they were doing in terms of providing catering. And it just felt like such a, um, you're providing sandwiches or Tip or something like that is not ending hunger. That's not really fundamentally what um, you know, the SDGs are about, particularly um, you in the context of um, of the UK. And um, so it's a very weak association. So we, we don't want to end up in that position. So we try to make sure that there is a high threshold in terms of what um, that we are claiming um, is is contributing towards meeting the sustainable development goals. So it is you know research that is targeted against um, you know, for example um, uh, reducing inequality and. Um, between men and women or, or inequality um, sort of in other contexts that's research in regard to the specifically related to, to health, for example, um, so that we try to set the bar quite high rather than just sort of scooping up everything um, and, and making um, a weaker argument that it's supporting the STGs. But we track that in a spreadsheet now and hopefully we'll eventually get even more sophisticated um, where it's tracked against um, sort of the different relevant STGs. So again, when it comes to reporting, we can actually quantify that. We can say that we have, um, you know, for example, you know, 18 papers that um, are aligned to um, SDG 6. 16, um, you know, or 15 papers that are aligned to SCG2. So we can then um, sort of actually have, you know, hard data in relation to that now. But again, it, you know, for anybody who's starting off on this, that's taken us years to get to that stage. You know, it's really, it's taken us um, probably a good three years to get to that point where we could track it against the SDGs um, or um, where, where uh, in the case of the module reviews, where we're getting that information from them, that probably again took us about three years to get every Everybody on board with that and get that system into place. So, um, you know, please don't think that um, you have to have everything figured out. Um, you know, by the time you've got your first report um, produced, come back to us and hopefully um, two years or, or four years, and we'll hopefully be further along the line. Well, great. I'm sure you'll be up there in the uh, non-first time report award winners in four or five years' time as well, Laura. Um, I like. I like. And I know Laura, it's time. It's time. It so I hand over back to you. But, bef but before we log off and before everybody goes, you'll be pleased to know that Sophie has been working in the background and is about to pull up a poll right now to ask those remaining in the room, and we are down to 38, there were 45 earlier, how many people, uh, well, the question's going to appear now, is it not, Sophie? I'm not exactly sure of the wording. Something to do with, are you personally overseeing the SIP report writing for your institution? and answer that question so we have the data from that poll while I make a few closing comments and I must remember to do it as well. 
and I've just submitted mine. No doubt Sophie will share the results in a minute or two. Can I say, though, um, from the UK and Ireland chapter, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been a lively conversation. The chat room has been as busy as what's been going on in the main room. Uh, we'll have very take very careful note of all these things that have um, that have been suggested. We haven't done justice to all the comments that are in the chat room. I know that. So uh, if you're feeling frustrated, be in touch with one of us later. We will collate them all though and make sure that they feed into the work of the um, SIP Impact uh, Reporting Group that Alec and others are part of as well. But from us within the UKI chapter, um, I hope that you have um, that you can see, that you can feel, that you can experience that we're a busy, we're an active, um, and we're a very enthusiastic chapter. If any of you would like to come and join um, all or part of our, our um, annual conference this year, which is happening in uh, early July, 6th and 7th of July, because it's entirely online, that would be possible. There is a small fee, but it's a very modest fee um, for any a prime member. Uh, you'll find more information on, on our website that I put the link to in our chat box earlier. I see 